Good evening, everybody. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that this task that I am given to talk about Judaism and the Jewish people to the 18th century is completely impossible, and I'm not going to do it. But what I am going to do is give you some areas to look at, some areas to think about, and also you have some reading, about 40-odd uh, pages of it, which I definitely recommend. And because you're hopefully going to be reading this, I'm not going to be talking about this all that much. <clears throat> but as I said, I want to give you some basic direction, and I also want to let you know that even though this is the only time you're going to see me until possibly the very end of the, uh, of the course, I'm a resource, and you have questions, email me. And you want to meet me, we can meet. And basically, it's very simple, ira.robinson at concordia.ca, and that will reach me. So, uh, is it here? Or? It, it's not no, there, it's so here. write it down, ira.robinson at concordia.ca, because if I'm going to do my job right, you're going to come out of here not with answers, but with questions. Because the one thing you can be absolutely certain about when you deal with Jews and Judaism, whether you're dealing with it historically or whether you're dealing it with it contemporaneously, is that there is absolutely nothing, and I repeat, absolutely nothing that has been said or uh, by people who are who claim to be an authority one way or another that has not been diametrically contradicted by somebody else who says, I am an authority. And just think for a moment. The Holocaust is only a few decades past, and there are still living representatives of both victims of the Holocaust and perpetrators of the Holocaust among us. Many fewer than there were, there still are. And yet, in the lifetime of both the perpetrators and the victims of the Holocaust, there are people who will tell you it never happened, or it was grossly exaggerated, or, well, lots of things. So once again, if that happens with the Holocaust, imagine when we're talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, or whatever it is, a few hundred years isn't, well, among friends, what's a few hundred years? But we're, uh, so I've got to cover an area that is thousands of years long and covers several continents and many changes won't be done in an hour, and it won't be done in 20 hours. So here's where we start. We start with the word or the term Jew. And there are two basic ways in which this term is understood. On the one hand, many people will say, Jew, well, that's a member of the Jewish religion, whatever that is and we'll get a little bit into that, or it's a member of the Jewish people, whatever that is. And here's what it is. It's a story. It's a fundamental story. It's the kind of story that tells people within a group who they are, where they came from, why things are the way they are. And, well, 
these are stories that are so true that they're true even when they're not always factual. Anthropologists have a name for this, a myth. Jews start with a story. And this story, as I said, is so resonant and so evocative for them that it's true even when it may not be completely factual. Here's an example. Jews think you go, you, uh, you stop a Jew on the street here or in Paris or in Tel Aviv and you ask them, where do you come from? In many cases, they will say, we come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We come from people who appear in something that's called the Hebrew Bible or for Christians, the Old Testament. And Jews will make the claim, we are the great, 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 etc., grandchildren of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, the story that is told in the Hebrew Bible is our story. It's the story of our ancestors. And this is true even when it isn't. Now, when isn't it true? It is not true when... It is not true for somebody who converts to Judaism. In other words, it's, it's possible to be a Jew because you are born in a Jewish family, and because you're in a Jewish family, you're Jewish, and it's automatic, and... Uh, nobody worries particularly about it. On the other hand, you can be a non-Jew. No, you see, once again, you have to understand, for Jews there are two categories. There is Jewish, and then there is a residual category called not Jewish. And if you are not Jewish, you can become Jewish. And you can become Jewish whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're uh, Asian or African or European or North American, it doesn't matter. You can become Jewish. So now, here's where stories and reality meet. And the story of Jews is the story of the Hebrew Bible. There was a man and a woman, Abraham and Sarah. And they, uh, the next generation, there was an Isaac and a Rebecca. Next generation, there was a Jacob and his wives, and so on. So, once again, Jews think they are descendants, you know, in a fairly literal sense, from uh, the descendants of the people that are talked about in the Hebrew Bible or for Christians, the Old Testament. And therefore, it's their story. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. This is part of the story of the Hebrew Bible. And people who think of themselves as Jews say, it's, this is a story, it's in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Exodus, it's a story that does, it's not happening to them then, because we are directly connected with that story. So, for instance, Jews have a holiday in the springtime, it's called Passover, Pesach in Hebrew. And in that holiday, they get together to reminisce and, in a sense, recreate the exodus from Egypt. And this is what Jews say at the family gathering called a Seder, which celebrates this holiday and commemorates this exodus. They, 
Jews say in the Seder? We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Not they, we. We are in, we Jews, they say, are included in that story. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and God brought us out from there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. And the text of the Seder goes on to say, and if God had not redeemed us from Egypt, then we, us, the people around the table, we, our children, and our children's children would still be slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. So once again, there is this existential, if you will, identification. They are us, we are them. And this goes, and this happens even when it is demonstrable that you or she or somebody is not a direct physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and everybody else. Because, as I said, it's possible to, for someone who isn't Jewish to convert to Judaism, to become Jewish. And, well, is there a problem here? Yes, there is. At least there is a problem that you, mu that you might consider. Consider this. When Jews pray traditionally, and my period once again is up to the 18th century, and certainly it's really true up to the 18th century. It starts changing in the 19th century. When Jews pray, and traditional Jews still pray in this way, they start their major prayer by saying, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. So that's fine. If you think that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if if uh, Abraham is your great, 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 etc., grandpappy, then that sounds fine. You are addressing, this is our God, this is the God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> In the Middle Ages, a convert to Judaism was troubled by this, very troubled. And he asked the question of the most prominent rabbi of his time, Moses ben Maimon, called Maimonides. And he said, Rabbi, what's this as far as I'm concerned? Jews are supposed to pray God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they aren't my literal ancestors. Am I supposed to pray like this? And Maimonides said, darn right you are. You are a Jew. These are your ancestors. And you are going to pray in this way. Yes, Jimmy? What's the story called? I beg your pardon? What's the story called? You didn't say his name. Okay, the, the man's name, uh, the man's name when he was a Jew, was Obadiah. This happens in the 12th century. He was an Italian. He was an Italian Christian cleric who converted to Judaism. And the first thing he did when he converted to Judaism was get out of Italy pronto, real fast, because it was worth his life in Christian lands, for a Christian to convert to Judaism, if they caught you, it was the death penalty. Fanny. Did people often convert to Judaism in this time? Relatively seldom, because both in Christian countries in the Middle Ages, in Christian countries in the Middle Ages, and in Muslim countries in the Middle Ages, 
for a Muslim or a Christian to convert to Judaism, if they caught you, they killed you. And they caught you, they killed everybody who was helping you. So when this Obadiah converted to Judaism, the first thing he did was flee the Christian world entirely, left Italy, wound up in Egypt. And in Egypt, he went to the greatest rabbi in Egypt in the 12th century, Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, as I told you. And he, so he asked the question, can I pray like the, all the other Jews? And the answer is, yes, you can and you must. So, once again, like I, as I began, the idea or the story, if you will, of these are our fathers, these are our ancestors, is so true in a fundamental sense that it's true even if it may not be factual. So now, once you, once you begin to understand this, now back to your question because there's a little more to it, Fanny. The, are there many people who con, uh, convert? <coughs> the answer is no, because to do so required, up to the 19th century, exceptional courage and fortitude, and not everybody has it. So, the, you know, we know of numerous cases where this happened. Sometimes they got caught and killed. Other times they successfully escaped, left town in a hurry. But once again, that we're going, we're going to deal with another aspect of that in a little while, but give me a few minutes. In the meantime, we have to consider something else. Okay, so Jews have this thing, and one part of this thing is we, they are us. They, the people in the Hebrew Bible, are us. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, second part of this equation is <clears throat> is not merely that we are a people and that they, the people who appear in the Hebrew Bible, are us, but there is also another very <coughs> deep resonant story that Jews have. And that is Jews understand that they're, that they are a people in a special relationship with their God. <coughs> and when I say special relationship, here's how it works. If you, if you want to look in the Hebrew Bible, go to the book of Exodus and go to chapter 20. And what you will see there is what is known to most people as the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, so-called, are, well, they're a series of statements that create a, what, is, what the scholars call a covenant or agreement between God and the people. This is how Tenth Commandment starts. I am the Lord your God who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of servitude. You will have no gods before me. Well, this is a relationship. I'm the, I'm the God who got you out of slavery. You will have no gods other than me, this is an exclusive contract. We just finished the Olympics. 
Do you remember which cola drink was the official uh, cola drink of the Olympics? Was it Coke or Pepsi? Coke. It was Coke. What would have happened if you, God forbid, had brought a can of Pepsi into the Olympic Village? Nothing. Off with your head. Because Coke paid millions and millions of dollars to be the official exclusive cola drink of the Olympics, and it would sue you. Anyway, exclusive contracts. Now, here's the thing. The, you can tell things about people by the sort of laws they tell, just as you can tell things about people the way they tell stories. So, we already talked about the story of we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. They are us. That begins to tell you certain things about people who think of themselves, call themselves Jewish. But laws also tell lots of things about people. Take a contemporary analogy, province of Quebec. You find out that when you have a public sign, it can be in French only, and if it's in French and English, French has to be twice the size as English and twice as prominent and everything like that. That tells you, begins to tell you certain things about Quebec. Here's how law begins to tell you certain things about Jews. Well, first thing to know is the is that when okay, when the Ten Commandments are given, if you look in the book of Exodus, you will see that there is a story as w that comes before the giving of the Ten Commandments. And the story goes like this. God says to Moses, this is what you're going to tell the people of Israel. I have taken you guys from your slavery. I've brought you here to me. And if you observe all of these laws that I am going to give you, then you are going to be special to me. Now, here's the thing. For Jews, in other words, Jews because of their relationship with the God of Israel as described in the Hebrew Bible, they think that they are special. And of course, Jews think they're special. Lots of other people think they're special. Japanese people think they're special. Koreans think they're special. Lots of people think they're special. Jews think they're special. So why do Jews have difficulties that Japanese and Koreans don't necessarily have? Here's why. Because their story that they are God's special people clashes with other stories about being God's special people because in Jewish history, Jews begin in a land in the eastern part of the Mediterranean that is now, roughly speaking, where Israel is. Okay? And they live in this land. They have their spiritual center in this land, in the city of Jerusalem. They have a temple 
in the city of Jerusalem that is the center of the worship of the God of Israel. Good. This uh, is interrupted because Israel happens to be a crossroads where armies and empires come and go and clash. And the people who become the Jews are caught in many of these clashes. And so, in the 6th century before the Common Era, 586 to be exact, one of the great empires of the ancient Near East, Babylonia, conquers Jerusalem, destroys the temple. A few decades later, Jews are allowed to rebuild the temple, but then in the year 70 of the Common Era, this temple is destroyed by the Romans, who at that point had taken over the Middle East and put down a revolt of the Jews very severely. So now, you have Jews whose land has been taken over by invaders. And these invaders have destroyed not merely their state, their commonwealth, but have destroyed their the Jerusalem temple, which as far as the Jews are concerned, more or less, is the only place on earth where the God of Israel is to be worshipped in a by way of sacrifices. Well, when the temple is destroyed in 70, there are lots of the Jews who survive probably thought, well, okay, been there, done that. The Babylonians destroyed the temple and a few decades later the Jews were allowed to rebuild. We're going to probably be able to do the same thing except it didn't happen and here's why it didn't happen. The Romans beat down a Jewish revolt in the year 70 CE in the Common Era. Christians often call this A.D., but uh, neutral language is C.E. common era. But then in the, about six decades later, in the year 132 C.E., the Jews revolt again against the Romans. And this rebellion lasts from 132 to 135, and it is put down with great trouble by the Romans, but it's put down and very severely, and the Romans are so PO'd that not merely do they destroy Jerusalem and they destroy the temple, uh, they but they had destroyed the temple and they're so PO'd that they decided we are going to wipe out the memory of the Jews in this land. And therefore, one of the things they did was invent a new name for this land. In ancient times, what this land in the eastern end of the Mediterranean that we now know as Israel was called Judea, the land of the Jews. And therefore, you know, a Jew, whether calling himself or herself a Jew in Hebrew, Yehudi, or in Greek, Judaios. They are people from Judea, Judaia. Well, the Romans invented a new name for this province. They began calling it Palestina. That's where Palestine gets 
invented. Pal the, the, the term, the geographical term Palestine is invented to expunge the Jewish presence from the land. So you can understand that in the aftermath of the rebellion of 132 to 135, there is no way that Jews are going to be allowed to rebuild their temple anytime soon. And in fact, well, it's still offline. Hmm. But wait a minute. Out of the destruction, this was a major and great, <clears throat> great destruction of one, uh, you know, of both 66 to 70, the first rebellion, which resulted in the destruction of the temple, and 132 to 135, which resulted in the reinvention of, the invention rather, of Palestine. Well, what do you get? you get the reinvention of or restatement of Judaism. Because Judaism in these centuries, in the second century, the third century, finds itself at a bit of an impasse. If you look at the writings of the Hebrew Bible, you will see that the right way to worship God is to bring sacrifices. And the, you know, you bring an animal, you bring lambs, goats, bullocks, you sacrifice them. Good. The Torah says so, you do it. And there's one place on earth, Jerusalem and its temple, where this is done. Now the temple is offline. What do you do with all these laws in the Hebrew Bible? Well, there are some of the laws that you that Jews can do without a temple being online. You know, you can observe the holiday of Sukkot, for instance, dwell in temporary booths. You can eat unleavened bread, matzah on Passover. There are things you can do. You can observe the Sabbath. So what is there to be done? What can what what are Jews supposed to do? By tradition, there are supposed to be six hundred thirteen commandments in the Hebrew Bible, in the Torah. And this is such a strong story, you know, there are 613 commandments, that it does, you know, it's, it's one of those things where everybody, everybody knowledgeable about Jews and Judaism will tell you the number, what's the number, 613? But once you start counting, everybody counts it, it differently. So nobody, everybody agrees it's 613, nobody agrees which 613 it is, but what, that doesn't matter for the moment. What matters for the moment is what happens with these commandments. So, the people who, there are two ways of understanding what has happened and what is going to happen. And one of these ways becomes known as rabbinic Judaism. And the other way is known as Christianity. I'll start with Christians, because we uh, Christians are an important part of this. Story. Christians are people who believe that a certain Jewish person, Jesus of Nazareth, was foretold in the books of the Hebrew Bible. His birth, his career, his death, his resurrection, every, Christ, people who think of, thought of themselves and think of themselves as Christians say, 
the Hebrew Bible is a prophecy or a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. And therefore, for Christians, it doesn't matter that there is no temple in Jerusalem online and that there is no sacrifice in the temple because Christians believe that in Christ they have a means of atonement for their sins that uh, you know that is at least equal possibly even better than the sacrificial system of the Jerusalem temple so Christians and the original Christians were Jews before Christianity became first a majority then an almost exclusively Gentile religious tradition which happens within a century or so of Christian origins. Anyway, Christians say the fact that there is no temple in Jerusalem it's okay because we have Christ as an atonement and as far as the laws of the of what to Christians is the Old Testament we accept the moral laws you know honor your father and mother Christians like that very much why not but uh, the other stuff well you know we'll let it lie it doesn't belong you know, it's it's not relevant it's not relevant, so and we don't think it should be relevant. Now, so as I said, one solution to this problem of the destruction of Judea and the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple is the Christian solution, which is, it's okay, we don't care. We will take the moral laws of the Old Testament and the rest of the Old Testament foreshadows Christ, that's good. What about Jews? What is their answer? Their answer is a rather different one. Because the, the Jews who historically are ongoing after the destruction of the temple, who achieve an intellectual hegemony after the destruction of the temple, these are people known as rabbis. And the Judaism that emerges in these centuries is known after them as rabbinic Judaism. And through the 18th century, it is the largest, most dominant way of Judaic interpretation. And even to this day, there are large numbers of Jews, especially Orthodox Jews, who embrace the interpretation of Rabbinic Judaism. So what does Rabbinic Judaism say about all of this? It says, first of all, you know, we hope that the temple will be rebuilt. That's a hope. You can hope lots of things. Christians have been hoping for a second coming of Christ for about 2,000 years. Jews have been hoping for a rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple for about the same period. It's a hope. So Jews hope. Part of this hope that Jews have is not merely that the temple will be rebuilt, but that they, the Jews, will be able to rebuild their lives in their land. And once again, this is a very important and quite deep, deeply resonant part of, of being Jewish. And to understand Jews, you have to begin to understand that Jews understand themselves have understood themselves for the last 2,000 years, that they are in exile from their land. They express it this way, in, in, and on all Jewish holidays, 
there is a prayer or part of the liturgy which says, because of our sins, we were exiled from our land. And the prayer goes on to say, please God, restore us to our land and restore the temple and restore the services and everything like that. Okay, so once again, deeply resonant, they are in exile, they want to return. Secondly, what do you do in the meantime between the time, you know, while you're hoping for a restoration of the temple, while you're hoping for a return to the land of Israel from wherever you're exiled, what do you do? And the answer rabbinic Judaism gave, and it was an answer that resonated with Jews and which became dominant in rabbinic Judaism for well over, uh, well, for well nigh 2,000 years. It's that you take what you have and make it make do with it. Here's the thing. Before the destruction of the temple, what Jews had was the temple and its worship and its sacrificial worship. Okay. They also had prayer and they had study. So you take away the temple and its sacrificial worship, you still have study and prayer. So one of the things you're going to pray for is restoration. That happens. The second thing is study. Study of Torah, which involves, first, of, first and foremost, study of the Hebrew Bible, particularly the first few books of the Hebrew Bible, which contain the most basic stories and laws. But now, these stories and laws are now restated by the rabbis. What do I mean by restated? They are restated in such a way as to connect the people studying with the offline temple and to create, if you will, a Jerusalem temple virtually. Create, in other words, a virtual reality. Here's how they do, do you it. mean restated, meaning they're giving an interpretation? About I what mean, it means? Uh, uh, what, once, once again, everything is interpretation because you see, the text remains the same, but the law, both the laws of the Torah and the stories of the Torah are represented. Here's, and the laws of the Torah are represented by the earliest rabbinic document known as Mishnah. And Mishnah, you see, does a systematic job. For instance, if you were looking in the Hebrew Bible for all the laws about the Sabbath, Shabbat, you would go to Exodus and find some, and Leviticus and find others, and Numbers and Deuteronomy. You have to go all over the place to find all the relevant laws. But what the ancient rabbis do in the third century is put all of these Sabbath laws in one place and put all the laws of Passover in one place, and all the laws of sacrifices in one place, and all the laws of ritual purity in one place. So it is re-presented. There is a representation of law. There is a representation of Torah as story. So now, here's where things become interesting. Let me give you an example from the Mishnah. Starts out, there's a tractate, which is what, how the divisions of Mishnah are called, about 
prayer, and the uh, prayer in its uh, largest sense, and it's the first, the very beginning starts. What time do we say the Shema prayer? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, our Lord is one. You say it morning and evening. What time do you say it in the evening? And the answer the Mishnah gives, from the time that the priests come in to eat their portion. Now, wait a minute. Something is strange here. This is written and edited about over a hundred years after the temple is destroyed. There is no temple. There are no priests. But the rabbinic restatement of Judaic law brings the student back to imagine the temple. In other words, now, the fact is that when does a Jew say the Shema prayer, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, Lord is one, in the evening? When it gets dark. So why don't the ancient rabbis simply say, you, when do we start saying the Shema prayer in the evening when it gets dark? And the answer is, uh-uh. We need to connect you, the student, with the priests and the temple that is not there online, but by doing this, you are doing a certain something that begins recreating the temple in virtual reality. And the virtual reality goes on so that wherever rabbinic, were, wherever the works, the, the uh, ancient rabbinic documents are studied, and in their totality, these ancient rabbinic documents are known as Talmud. Wherever they're studied, the temple in Jerusalem becomes not then and there. The temple becomes some. The temple and its ritual becomes something that we are discussing now. If you went to a rabbinic academy either 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or right now, and you overheard rabbinic students discussing the rituals, they would not say, that's what the high priest did then and there. Rather, you would hear them saying things like, and now the high priest does this, and now the high priest does that, and now the uh, second priest, the priest goes and does this. Once again, this study becomes a this study becomes first of all a recreation in virtual reality of that which has been lost. But secondly, secondly, it becomes part of the worship in, 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 part of the part of the r rather part of the atonement process because here's what the rabbi said the rabbis the ancient rabbis taught that by you know that by study by study of Torah you could do the equivalent of what was done in the temple. It's not exactly the same, and no rabbi would say it's exactly the same. But study becomes, in the absence of an online temple and its sacrificial worship, it becomes a viable alternative. This is what the rabbis taught. This is what Jews historically believe. Now, back to Christianity, because this becomes another important part of our story. Christians, you, uh, you remember, had this different interpretation, which is that, yes, 
the temple is offline and therefore the laws of sacrifice and ritual purities connected with the temples are offline and that's fine we don't need them we have Jesus Christ <laughs> well the second thing but but but, but the, the important thing to understand about Christians is one thing more actually two things more but the, the first thing is that the stories of the Hebrew Bible, which the Christians adopt as the Old Testament, become their stories. They, you know, once again, for a Christian, these stories are no longer, as far as the Christians are concerned, about people calling themselves Jews. They are about us, Christians. And you see some very important resonances of this to our day. Think of the American South in the time of Jim Crow segregation in the 20th century, where white people said to African Americans, you guys are nothing and worse than nothing and you're always going to be subservient to us. And there were African American voices because they were Christians who said, wait a minute, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and God brought us out of there. If God could do it to the ancient Israelites, who are spiritually us, God can do it with us as well. Once again, you know, this is just an example of, you know, so the, the, what for Jews is the Jewish story becomes for Christians the Christian story. And here's, here's the rub. If you were, it would be possible, theoretically, to say, okay, well, can't we both share this story? You know, can't my story be your story and your story be my story? And the historical answer was, until very, 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 very recently, no. Until very, very, very recently this was played as a zero-sum game, which is, if God loves Christians, can't possibly love the Jews, or vice versa. Yeah, what, what, I mean, what made it recently, was it a, a Well, it's part, once again, it's partly Vatican II in the 1960s. That gets pretty contemporaneous. Because here's the thing, the Christian understanding was, and it's expressed very deeply, it's deeply resonant in this collection of early Christian documents that we know of as the New Testament. Okay. The New Testament is all about Jesus Christ, one way or another. And... Jews play a role in the New Testament. And it's not one that the Jews wrote or would write for themselves, but they're the bad guys. They're the ones who killed Christ. They're the ones who killed God's only begotten Son. And they are guilty if you follow the New Testament writings, if you follow the Gospel of Matthew, for instance. They are guilty by their own statement, his blood be upon us and our descendants. So, for early Christians, Jews have Jews, the Jews, 
have done something that is more horrible than anything one could possibly imagine. And God should and does punish the Jews for that. And, well, that gets very involved, but wait a minute. The, uh, there's another side to it, a slightly more positive side to it. Because you, were say, you, you might say, well, if the Jews are that bad, we should get rid of them all if we can. The Messiah comes, the Jews are going to convert? Yeah, no, that's, the, that's the other side of it. Precisely, you're, you're right on the money. The Jews are going to convert what, to Christianity? You betcha. Mm -hmm. Because here's what the Apostle Paul says in, I believe, Romans. He says, look at it, the guy, he says, guys, he's talking to Christian communities, guys, look at it this way. The coming of Christ was the fall of the Jews. But the Jews are going to be rejoined to the living tree that is, of course, for Paul, Christianity. And it is a sign that the, the reconciliation of Jews into the church, in other words, the conversion of Jews to become Christians, is a sign that Christ is coming again, and you can't have Christ come again unless the Jews convert. So therefore, you can't destroy them all. You have to keep them around and you have to convince them to become Christians. Because the second coming of Christ depends on it. So there is, and there's another aspect to that. And the other aspect is put down in, by one of the great early church fathers, St. Augustine, who says, the Jews are our enemies, but they are the people who give us the Old Testament. And precisely because they're our enemies, and their custodianship of the Old Testament shows that we aren't making this up out of whole cloth. We have the Old Testament because of the Jews. So there, you know, there is some vaguely positive thing. Okay, so, but once again, here's what, so there is a fight between early, you know, early sec, common era centuries Judaism and early common era centuries Christianity. It's a divorce. And at stake in the divorce is not who owns the sofa and who owns the stereo. It's who owns the story? We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Who is it talking about? Is it talking about the Jews? That's what the Jews say. Is it talking about the Christians? That's what the Christians say. So, whose story is it? Who, in other words, is, as the, as the, the way the debate goes, who is the real Israel? Will the real Israel stand up? Is it the people, the Jews, who say, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's us. That's our great, 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 great grandpappy. Or is it Christians who say, forget about the, this uh, physical descent. We are the true spiritual descendants of the great prophecies of the Old Testament which are fulfilled in Christ. So, once again, there is a, this divorce and it's a messy divorce and there is lots of animosity generated and you can feel this animosity 
it, as you read the New Testament, and you read what the New Testament says about Jews, and you read what the early church fathers say about Jews generally, it's not completely negative. There is There are certain ambivalences, but by and large it's pretty negative. Well, the point is that by the 4th century CE, Christianity becomes the leading religion within the Roman Empire. So Christians become empowered. And in their empowerment, they try to arrange so that Jews, while they are to be tolerated, are to be tolerated as second-class third class, whatever you want to call it, citizens. So that, for instance, it is very clear that, uh, you, know, Christian, you know, Christians legislate so that, for instance, Jews cannot own slaves. In a, sla in a society, the ancient Roman Empire, which is built on slave labor. Christians legislate Jews may not own slaves. That means, well, that there, there are many economic and social ramifications of that we don't have time for. But just understand that Jews are in a situation where in Christian countries they are a minority where the majority culture and religion says Jews are our enemies. And the only true solution to for Jews is for them to become us, for them, the Jews, to become Christians. One more thing to say. Christians aren't the only ones to say their story is our story. Because in the 7th century out of the Arabian Peninsula you get the rise of Islam. Islam is slightly different from Christianity in that, well, it comes after both Judaism and Christianity. And it has access to Jewish stories and Christian stories. And if you read the Quran, you will see that stories from the Hebrew Bible are there. There are plenty of them. Stories from the New Testament are there. There are plenty of them. Islam has adopted these stories. And Islam's claim is, yes, God did give the Torah to the Jews. God did give the New Testament to the Christians. But then God gave, for a third time, his revelation to the Arabs in Arabic and God will reveal no more. The revelation, uh, if Muslims believe that God's revelation to the Prophet Muhammad is the last, the best, and the absolutely final one. So, when Islam comes to power, Islam works with both Jews and Christians, and also Zoroastrians, by the way, but works with them in some of the same ways in which Christians dealt with Jews. In other words, Islam is the superior religion. Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians are lesser religions, but they're still tolerate as long as they uh, 
uh, as long as they follow rules which emphasize the superiority of Muslims and the inferiority of Christians and Jews. For instance, only, uh, only Muslims could bear arms, you know, swords and bows and arrows and whatever. Jews and Christians are therefore, like women, to be protected. They are called, in fact, protected peoples, or in Arabic, al-al-dhibba, because, well, they are, you know, they, they have, you know, you can't, if you are not able to defend yourself, you know, you need to be protected. Like women are not supposed to bear arms, they need to be protected. Jews and Christians can't bear arms, they need to be protected also. Here's another thing. Public displays of religion are reserved for the top religion. In Christendom, Christians have a monopoly of public displays of religion, church bells, church processions. In Islam, Muslims have a monopoly of or are supposed to have a monopoly of religious expression. The, here's, you know, the one exception that both Christians and Muslims had to make was funeral processions. Jews in Christian countries, Jews and Muslims in Muslim countries were allowed to take the you know in a you know in a ceremonial way take the body of the deceased from the town to the cemetery outside the town. But note this: on a regular basis, Jewish funeral processions in Christian Europe in the Middle Ages, Jewish and Christian funeral processions in medieval Islam, were often stoned and otherwise harassed because the public display of Judaism in medieval Christendom, the public display of Judaism or Christianity or any other religion that is tolerated in medieval Islam, which includes in Iran, Zoroastrianism, that is not to be tolerated. And, well, that sort of sums up where we're at. Because until the 18th century, which is where this lecture is getting to, until that time, you have a situation where people calling themselves Jews are almost always in a position of inferiority as a tolerated religious minority. In Christian lands, Jews are the only tolerated minority, and we understand already the built-in ambivalences of Christianity towards Judaism. There's much more to say, but not really time to say it. But secondly, in Islam, where Jews and Christians and sometimes Zoroastrians are all there, there is, uh, you know, that they, they, they are in a similar position of legislated institutional inferiority. And this uh, you know, and, and once again, there are Jewish settlements outside of Christendom, outside of Islam. There are Jewish communities in India, for instance. And there are Jewish communities in China. But they're far from the mainstream. The mainstream of Jews 
up to the Middle Ages, up through the end of the Middle Ages, up through the 18th century, we're talking about people living with institutional inferiority, where Jews play a story in this sacred literature of the dominant group that is sometimes semi-positive and sometimes quite negative. We've seen that in terms of Christianity. In Islam, as I said, stories from the Hebrew Bible are often incorporated, some with some sort of the way they are, some with changes. For instance, in the Hebrew Bible, you read the story about how Abraham takes his uh, beloved son Isaac and brings him according to God's command as a sacrifice, which is at the, uh, aborted at the end. And the Muslim account is that God tells Ibrahim to take his beloved son Ismail to be sacrificed at God's command. So once again, there are stories taken whole cloth, some stories that are echoed, but there are also ambivalences in Islam because Muhammad, when he comes to power in Medina, he is opposed by Jewish tribes who live in this area and who form the backbone of the political opposition to Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, and therefore, they, these Jews are treated quite negatively. But it is said, Jews are plotting against the prophet. Well, once again, that has these negative ambivalences within the Quran and within the Hadith, the, the body of traditions about the prophet that make up so much of Islamic thought have resonances to this day and they provide contemporary Islamists with a plethora of anti-Jewish texts that they can use. Well, once, so, what, so once again, you're, what, what I'm doing now, what I've done now is to give you a sort of bare bones story so that you are able to put in some sort of context where Jews are when Professor Krantz is going to take up the story in the next session, the next lecture, so that you will, un so that when he talks about Jews in a legally and culturally inferior position, you will have something to hang it on. And that's, once again, why I recommend that you read the two chapters in Mark Cohen, because Mark, these two chapters talk about the legal position of Jews in medieval and early modern Christendom, the legal position of Jews within Islam. And for the rest of it, I am a resource. Email me. I will be happy to answer your questions. If they're too involved, I will say, let's meet and talk about it some more. But there are lots of things to say I deal with all of this stuff in my uh, course, Introduction to Judaism. I have 13 weeks there. I have one hour here. Did the best I could. Thank you very much.